Good evening, everyone. It's a pleasure to be moderating this session on lifting Pakistan's cities um, and to be here discussing the subject with two of the foremost minds in the country on both architecture and urbanism, um, Arif Hassan Saab and Professor Yasmin Chima. Um, it's a pleasure to welcome you here. And um, if I may just uh, drift through a slideshow to give an overview of what is actually happening in our cities at the moment. Share? Yes. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> Can you make it? Yeah. Okay, great. I need to go from. Sorry, Last just slide. a second. Can mm. can we start from the beginning slide, please? Okay. Sorry about this. We'll just uh, get the first slide up. And essentially, what we're looking at is. Uh, how cities in our part of the world about 100 years ago, um, even in fact about 40 years ago, um, looked a certain way. And these are paintings, for instance, done of Lahore and the kind of typical urban fabric that you would see in the city. You'd see large gatherings of people around. But nowadays, this is an example from Pindi, where we see actually the entire building stock being replaced by substandard buildings and uh, very often, very heartlessly demolished or cut off. Uh, this is Lakshmi Chowk during the rains of last year. Um, they were both south here. This is Hyderabad, the kind of urban landscape that we encounter now. Uh, our cities now are often signified by blockages, congestion, and lots and lots of smoke. And essentially what we're seeing is a situation that is leading to widespread environmental degradation, huge dips in the quality of living across, uh, across the board, across the country. And uh, this is an image, for instance, from Lahore, the area around the Ring Road, where we see smoke essentially coming from a handful of factories but blanketing the entire city. It's a problem that can easily be resolved, but somehow remains, quote unquote, a wicked problem lacking a fundamental fix. This is the sort of smog that we've been encountering in Lahore this year. The readings today were around 300. And very often land management practices such as the burning of stubble and uh, the kind of impact it can have over kilometers isn't even factored in. Uh, we're also seeing large-scale environmental degradation happening in areas such as the salt range uh, through the introduction of several cement manufacturing plants, which are literally chewing up the mountains. Now we actually see also that agricultural land is up for grabs. Um, land which once would have acted as a carbon sink and stabilized the kind of pollutants that we're emanating through our factories as well as through our traffic would have been somehow, perhaps, hopefully, optimistically speaking, been buffered uh, uh, by this green sort of belt that once surrounded Lahore. This is an image from what used to be fields uh, and is now defense phase six. That's a close-up of the existing urban fabric for the villages that once were here and uh, new housing that will occur parallel to it. Similarly, well, if we look at other instances in other countries, um, for instance, if we see England, we see that natural assets, fields have all been retained, but tracks of urban housing or sub-urban sub housing have been introduced in large metropolitan areas such as cities uh, like London. Uh, this is another image where you can see how the natural assets and fields have been retained. In Lahore, from 2007, 
we find that about 75% of the tree cover to date has been lost and largely sacrificed for road expansions and mass transit schemes. And the vegetation that's replacing these entire, um, you know, natural sort of corridors or planted sort of tree-lined avenues are plastic pots filled with sort of creepers and somehow these are meant to add a natural sort of element to an otherwise completely alien landscape. The increasing urban extent in Lahore shows us very clearly that the loss of arable land around the city has been at least twice the size of the footprint of the city in 1984. Um, in Karachi, we've seen hundreds of thousands of hectares being reclaimed from the sea and turned into, into housing. In Multan, we're also seeing similar trends where orchards that once uh, bore fruit are being turned into housing. But yet, despite this, somehow, Pakistan's housing shortage remains some of the highest in South Asia. Despite the government opening up new areas for housing, um, such as the areas around the Margala Hills on the other side in Haripur, I think one can expect that the development that will take place will be very similar to what's happened in Banigala, for instance where we see very hideous architecture or commanding architecture uh, take over the landscape. This um, image, uh, actually the next image shows us Gizri village as it is seen today. It's essentially a DHA neighborhood. And then we move into Lahore where we see the historic Mal Road being completely chopped up and uh, rewired for the orange train and the GPO underground station. The landscape of the city has been completely brutalized and uh, for lack of a better word, pillaged. Uh, on McLeod Road, once lined with trees, this is the sort of landscape or the streetscape that confronts you. The loss of uh, high density housing units for the orange train has also been extreme. And uh, in the case of Jain Mandir and Anarkali in particular, we saw at least 10,000 people being uprooted from Jain Mandir, Bengali building and Kapoorthala house. This is an image of Kapoorthala house in its current state. About seven years ago, we also worked on uh, the Mal Road. And by we, I mean uh, the Office for Conservation and Community Outreach, which is an urban design think and do tank that um, I'm privileged to kind of direct. But at the same time, seven years later, none of this work is visible. Um, in terms of a sustainable urban policy, the work simply could not be sustained. Um, we see, for instance, this is the Baba Dinga Singh building, and this is now the Ghulam Rasul building right after we finished our work. And then this is the Ghulam Rasul building today uh, with a collapsed dome which occurred in, uh, in, in, in the summer rains this year, if I'm not mistaken, last year. Um, it, of course, has not been restored. And uh, the street, of course, looks much worse for the wear. And uh, even sort of in highly sensitive archaeological, architecturally significant corridors, such as the GT Road, uh, the spine that has Zebun Nisa, uh, sorry, Shalimar Bagh, Gulabi Bagh, and uh, what was it? I'm forgetting the last one. But essentially, this is the landscape that we see today the orange train brutally sort of standing next to the bridges of the World Heritage Site. In Karachi, Mohatta Palace, the skyline is also disturbed with high density, high rise developments happening right uh, next to it. 
that obscure its silhouette against the sky. Similarly, we've seen rainwater play havoc from cities like Karachi to Lahore. We've also seen that uh, the orange train has significantly altered the streetscape of McLeod Road, for instance. In this patch, we see Ratan Cinema as it's framed by the viaduct. And uh, next, we see Mayo Hospital um, in an early view taken at the tail end of the 19th century, um, where the dome that you see on the right in its current state looks somewhat like this. Uh, we lack the capacity to apparently restore the dome, so we are letting it rot. And the dome was actually sealed off from public view, but the interior of the dome can still be seen right now on the right side of this image. Uh, the use of materials that, for instance, endanger heritage buildings through fires, um, which have occurred in very significant places like the National College of Arts, also is something to think about. The uh, Chambra Mandi in Lahore, for instance, has lost all its streets that were once lined with havelis, and wholesalers dealing in chambra and leather goods have moved in. We also see a bit of heritage mismanagement happening around the fort, um, where two summers ago, an entire wall collapsed because of bad drainage. I believe the problem has been addressed, but the endemic source of the, the crisis has not. At the Badshahi Masjid, we see blue fiberglass tanks being perched on top of the, the building and uh, completely in disconnect with views that the new restaurants from in front of it command. Um, we also see the Gulabi Bagh now dwarfed by the viaduct on GT Road for the orange train. And uh, the Choburji, for instance, is barely seen from the road now, fenced in, uh, dwarfed by the viaduct again, and uh, essentially world heritage sites like the Shalimar we have encroached on heavily all around the 250 foot radius that was once set has been largely ignored and basically buildings now exist at about 20 to 30 feet away from the uh, from the garden itself. At Shadra in uh, Lahore, we also see buildings creeping up around Jahangir's tomb, um, obscuring the boundary between the river and the monument. In the much celebrated Sethpur village in uh, Islamabad, um, we see degradation occurring again because of bad management, waste disposal, and uh, land use practices. This stream used to be completely pristine and brimming with water, but at this moment, it's largely brimming with garbage. Our cities were once verdant, uh, you know, kind of uh, settlements, planned for shade, uh, designed for the weather. And um, now our cities are sort of offering us landscapes that are completely unprotected from the sun and uh, in turn add to the problems such as the energy crisis, which requires all these homes lining the street without shade to actually rely solely on air conditioning and an excessive use of energy. In Pindi, again, we see that the urban fabric has been largely, largely disturbed by this introduction of the metro bus. In Bolton Market, we again see that the public is gathering on the road with barely any space for this function to occur. In Southern, we see a completely changed landscape in Karachi, where land uh, mafias and property speculation have transformed the once cultural and economic hub of a city into basically warehousing. 
and uh, Arif sir, I wonder if you'd like to comment on what has been happening in uh, Empress Market and uh, the fact that it was actually once uh, a very sort of used space and is now proposed to become a museum and a, a, a center for restaurants, I believe. Well, uh, the so-called encroachments from this entire area were removed on the orders of the Supreme Court. And it's, I think about 9,000 hawkers approximately and 3,000 shops were affected. Uh, it was very sad because it may have been the law, but it certainly was not justice by any standards. It was a huge economy, uh, wholesaling, retailing, manufacturing, and uh, wholesaling that was linked to trade and commerce outside Pakistan, to Kenya, to Southeast Asia, to Africa. It was very much a part of the culture of the city. And we made many proposals over the years to satisfy the government that it could be managed in a manner which the government's objections could easily have been removed, uh, which the government's objections were anarchy, traffic jams because of them, them ugliness, disorder. Mm. And the hawkers and shopkeepers were quite willing to do whatever the government wanted them to remove this, uh, these aspects. As a matter of fact, at one meeting, they said, aap kehte, gande hai, log yahan gand aate hai. Aap bataiye, kis kisim ka uniform pehnenge, wohi pehn ke aayenge hum. Bilkul saap. <laughs> Aur aap kehe, hum topi pehn ke aayenge. Ek ek kisim ki topi bata di di aap hume. They even proposed lines, that we draw a line here, not one inch beyond this line will we step. And they proved that, to show that it was possible. I think the biggest problem in this was, if I might say so, uh, policy makers inko insan nahi samajhte. They are not human beings. This is the issue of equity. Mm. A very heavy anti-poor bias in <coughs> policy and planning, which, in, which, by the way, if I might say so, educational institutions also instill in their Absolutely. students. Absolutely. The other thing is that gentrification, the word is wrong, in our context, at least in the case of Empress Market, the concept of heritage, it was really the takeover of land from the poor and handing it over to the rich. That is what it was. It was the taking away of space from them. Now we can talk about this and we can talk about the fundamental issues that arise out of that, but we can talk about that later. But uh, Professor Chiba, how do you respond to taking over heritage sites in the uh, urban fabric for programmatic or area renewal? Um, in sites or plots adjacent to a site of intervention? I mean, do we see, for instance, or do we even uh, begin to imagine that if Empress Market is gentrified in this manner, that it would have a transformative or a Bilbao effect on the urban fabric adjacent to it? I think I really don't think so, because the fact remains that it's um, that Empress Market was a market always, not like the big market, which was an exhibition hall in the beginning. You know? So when you take away the use of a building, the function of a building, so basically it's, it's inherent values goes with it, you know. I'm not talking about people, but also the fact that how, what is the significance of the building? What is the, what's the historical use of the building? So if you take that away and then you I mean, it's not like adaptive use or anything. You still, you have the same building, 
the only things that you're taking with the use of that building. And so the, how, do we begin, was, how do we begin to use anything. this idea of urban renewal through the management of better, uh, shall we say, upkeep of entire sections of our cities that are historic and that are uh, quote unquote beyond help. No, I take this book, it's uh, a uh, research which I did with two of my, two of my students long time, long time back. If we were you know, talking about areas, we were not talking about buildings. And you probably got that book of mine, historical quarters, you know. And I think that somewhere we were doing, doing a door to door research, you know, compiling a door to door research. And the whole idea was because this is historical quarters, we should try and sell it to historical quarters. And if you were looking at things, there were buildings which were well designed, new buildings, the well designed those uh, quarters. And some were unsympathetic, but um, you know some of that got lost when I came back to Pakistan, uh, to Lahore, Pakistan, Punjab <laughs> is Pakistan by then. So, no people. I think the people for people who took over from me, they are looking more at buildings now, and they of course grading it, which I didn't do, like A grade, B grade, C grade. So, but uh, but, but the Arisa, whole does it even changed. gee does it even help us to uh, consider heritage conservation and uh, preservation? How how in your mind does that actually help uplift entire cities? Are you asking me the question? Or... Well, if you'd like to answer it, that's great. No, if you do that, you know, then of course. I mean, why do people go abroad, you know, fatigue, they don't go, except for Dubai, it's all new. When people go abroad, they go to the historical areas, right? So I don't know, even the bureaucrats and the politicians and all of these people, you know, they go to the historical areas. And when they come back to Pakistan, they forget about it. So that is something that's always amused me. And they're coming back to a cement problem. You were talking about cement factories. Um, you know, I was watching DW the other day. What they're doing in Germany and Netherlands, they're recycling Indeed. old, recycling old material. You know, whatever That's they great. have in like bathroom tiles and you know, uh, even you know, sanitation thing and then uh, metal. Everything is being being recycled. So I think that if we started the trend in our practices here, that would be but, a great help. But, in but to take the recycling analogy forward, Arif Sab, how do we recycle entire sections of our, our cities, such as Raja Bazar, Sadar, uh, Mal Road? How do we even begin to consider this? Look, I don't think you can begin something without going into the basics. These, you can make islands of this sort of thinking, yes, and very beautiful islands. But the issues are somewhat bigger. I would say there are four fundamental issues. If you do not tackle them, your cities will continue to grow as they are growing. And you will have, and you will only create small islands of so-called good practice, and eventually they will be swallowed up by the bad practice. <laughs> now, the first issue, and this is a very fundamental issue, which is now coming home to Karachi, and that is the question of equity. Indeed. In the planning process, there has to be an element of equity. And equity, the most important issue about on equity is that of housing. Indeed. Without tackling that at appropriate locations, you cannot tackle the question of equity, number one. Number two is the question of land. 
you cannot conserve and use land appropriately without an urban land reform. You need a very serious urban land reform. And the conditions <coughs> in the country are telling you as to what sort of urban land reform you need. Number three, you need to double or triple the cost of your automobiles so that people can't buy them. And you have to reduce the cost of your motorcycles and introduce e a energy efficient and green motorbikes and phase out the rest in a period of 10 to 12 years. And, fin and finally, is that you have to have a plan to protect the ecology of the area in which your city or settlement is located. Now, it is very easy for, for me to say all this. You tell me, how do you do it? I put up a whole document on urban land reform to some members of the Sindh Assembly. Eka comment yata is tara se to hum mar jayenge. What did I say? Don't you think that this is a population problem also? Yes, of course it is. Certainly, very much so. I think they're central to most of these things. Yes, it is. But these, irrespective of whether your population comes down, this process is going to continue. Give me a few examples that will illustrate this, I think. Kachi Abadis of Karachi have a density of about 1,000 to 1,500 persons per hectare. The inner city of Karachi has densities of up to 3,000 persons per hectare. Defense Society has a, a density of 80 persons per hectare. Now, what do you need to do? It's obvious what you need to do. I mean, one doesn't have to be a genius to take, figure that out. 33%, sorry, not 33, 63% of all Karachi's residential land is occupied by 11% of its population. Mm -hmm. And Karachiites would be surprised if I told them that only 12% of Karachi plots are more than 240 square yards. And 97% of those are less than 120 square yards. Now, uh, what I'm trying to say is that the land reform has to, in my opinion, has to consist of one, a land seeding act. Number two, a heavy a fine on non-utilization of land. Mm -hmm. Number three, a minimum density for high income groups that it is going to be so much and uh, sorry, maximum density. And what is more important is that entire areas are declared and we can identify those areas which cannot be constructed over at all. This has to be a regional plan into which these things are under research being master plan except superficially, nothing in detail. The detail had to be a follow-up, which never happened. Karachi ka bhi yehi hai. To kya karenge aap? Ab finally, jis cheez pe aap aare hain, it is the aesthetics of it, it is the history of it. It is very much subservient to these three issues that I have raised. Gariya hongi, density ke kawaneen nahi hongi, zameen jo hai, uska istemal but Arif Saab, if for example we consider the dynamics of uh, our smaller cities, 
is it possible do you think to talk about urban renewal in these smaller cities like say for example Ud Sharif where professor Chima has had been working since a, a, about two decades it certainly is but are things have changed so much over there you know all the sil silver smiths have disappeared I remember that not that I've been to it, but I keep hearing about it. That, um, you know, Parveen used to come and buy a lot of silver jewelry from what you, if you remember. And they're not there anymore. The, I believe the Buhari Bazaar is gone. <clears throat> been, uh, the plots have been sold for houses. And uh, if you remember, there was this uh, Nila Bazaar. The Mela Bazaar belongs to the Bukharis. And the Mela Bazaar is, you know, like apparently it's got nothing on it anymore. So whatever we suggest, suggested for Ocho, I mean, I think it hasn't been implemented at all. Neither are people bothered about it. The population when we were there was 20,000. Now it's 45,000. And they're eating into the hidden land, you know, the agricultural land. And, um, but there's a lot of poverty in Ruch now. I mean, much more than it was before. Okay. So, Our whole culture has changed. But we have to, the culture is not going to adapt to us as planners or as architects. We have to see how that culture that is emerging can be used in a manner which creates a better environment than what it is creating today. That mm. is why but, these four But the culture is favoring property speculation and, uh, you know, how do we kind of get out of that and unwrapping the nexus between land developers, land holding and managing authorities and politicians? Look, if you have no utilization fee, manage The problem is who is going to put an on utilization fee? Who is going to pass that law and who is going to implement it? Very true. And also, Ali always says that you, the bigger houses like ours, they should pay more property tax. But uh, you know, and the smaller houses should pay less property tax. They do, yes. Yeah. They do. But I don't think that's going to get implemented either. But Professor Chima, I was wondering that um, from the work that I've seen of yours at Uch, which talked about public spaces, it, talk, it talked about mm. community development, it talked about and proposed heritage trails based on the idea of what is now being touted as religious uh, tourism. Um, how come that despite all this work and the gravity of the work, that um, it just wasn't picked up or uh, considered seriously for implementation. I don't know, I think because I haven't been there for a long time, like we are telling you. I think that's basically the two peers are not getting along as usual, you know. One is a Shia and one is a Sunni. And the Sunni is the one who's the MPA. The historical area is all Bukhari's. So, not so Arif, sir, does the uh, does the idea of patronage from on high actually affect the form of our cities? It does, yes. But patronage, who is the patron? What is the culture of the patron? What are his intentions? I mean, this is what what matters. They cannot do Purana Nizam tha apka apke shehru ka wo to khatam ho gaya dehato ka wo bhi khat. खत्म हो गया पंचायत गई जात के मोहल्ले गए जात के गिरज मोहल्ले थे नंबरदार गया पटेल गया चौधरी गया रहा क्या हुकूमत का कोई कानून नहीं है जिसने इसको रिप्लेस किया हो जिरगा की कोई मॉडल अथॉरिटी नहीं रही so you have a huge vacuum that needs to be filled so that appropriate policy can be made. 
And I think this is my view, maybe it's wrong, but having uh, indulged in a number of uh, projects, in a number of agitation against projects, I feel that if <coughs> the professionals of this country, which I, in which the lawyers are included, are willing to stand up for policies and to push them, they would be pushed. If they, we can push for a major public reform, public sector reform, which has been demanded consistently since 1968-69, I think we would make a big step forward. But for that, there has to be a common agenda. There has to be a common understanding. There has to be a will to struggle for change. I personally think that not this generation, which is right now young, but the one after that will be forced to do it. They will have no option. And you can, with all the work that you've done, you can lay the foundations of it. Sir, coming to I mean, it just uh, sounds a little too hopeful, given uh, this. No, 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 but Arif, what I find very strange is that our cities don't have any footpaths. Absolutely. They don't have any footpaths. What are doing footpaths? Yeah, hmm? No city has any footpath to walk on. BHA with all its claims doesn't have any either. Footpaths are but is rather the rule. Mere nazdi koi aur cheez nahi hai. Sabse pehli cheez honi footpaths hai. Mere ghar ke saath. सामने फुटपाथ होती थी नई सड़क बनी उसमें निकाल दी मैंने इलाके के नाजिम साहब से कहा भाई आपने फुटपाथ क्यों निकाल दी तो उन्होंने मेरे से कहा आरिफ भाई आपने कभी किसी को फुटपाथ पे चलते देखा है कराची में ऑब्वियसली यू डोंट नीड फुटपाथ टू कॉल नोबडी वॉक्स ऑन देम ये हम लोग सड़कों पे चलते हैं इट्स वेरी डेंजरस बिकॉज़ सो पीपल हु वॉक डू वॉक यू नो इट्स नॉट दैट एवरीवन हैज अ कार most of them walk, the majority walk. It would be nicer to, to walk in the city and to navigate it, you know, uh, in a more interactive way. Um, but the fact is that when you start even walking on the road, even say Mal Road, the heights of the footpaths are uneven. The pavement is often, uh, you know, filled up with garbage or a gigantic sort of waste management sort of container is put right there or a khamba or in the case of right outside uh, you know LDA's plaza we see workers bathrooms now being put on the footpath and not having been removed even after eight years of construction on that site so we you know, see when, when I was in MCA there was a big footpath hey, they used to be on Mars Road. I used to walk on them even in the summers. We, uh, we have a question from the audience, uh, which is essentially where is the architectural and urban culture of Pakistan headed to? I think the both of you are. Uh, you know, in the best position to give an overview. No, no, ahead, as far as conservation is concerned, you know, we have, don't have a single program, master's program in that subject. So, you know, why, why, how many people there come? There must be a handful of people, 12, 15, who are real, have a master's degree in conservation. PhD to force high level. So unless we start to, you know, sort of we establish a department somewhere, I don't care where, but you know, I think that we, we cannot 
talk about conservation in a very serious manner. But in terms of design, what we see in contemporary sort of uh, architectures today, Arisa, do you find much confusion about how to handle the weather or the climate? For me, climate is the most important. And I think that the response to the climate <clears throat> is really or would be the real architecture of Pakistan. I mean, the architect has to respond to the climate, he has to respond to his uh, client, <clears throat> he has to respond to the site, respond to a whole lot of things. He has to respond to the heritage around him. The problem is that he only responds to his client. And this Quite is... Right. Sorry? Quite right. Quite right. We, we always have... He responds to his client. Now, all right, as an individual, he responds to his client. Let's put that aside. Indeed. But you have organizations that represent architects in this country. <clears throat> what are the policies that they push? Not as rhetoric, not as slogans, but in terms of properly worked out documents with mm -hmm. statistics, with issues, and with solutions. If you can show me one such document published by, not by a, a schools, but by architectural organizations, I would be grateful. So then, I, in short, we, we think that uh, the heritage of tomorrow is going to be a placeless series of buildings. Yes, without, um, they don't represent anything specific in specific terms. I was, and my organization were at one stage struggling against the elevated expressways through Bandar Road. That matter was thankfully resolved. And I went to a representative, a head of an architectural organization. And I said to him, why don't you throw your weight behind this? Not only that, we will make you the chairman of this movement. And he said to me, Ari bhai, wo to theek hai, magar hum log to bazaar mein baithe hai. So if you sit in the bazaar, then you can buy and buy the architecture. And you can buy and buy the architecture. But then I think it goes back to a more fundamental issue education and what we're teaching in our colleges and our departments. Um, Professor Chima, do you think that the kind of teaching that we're doing is even close to the kind of architecture we should be making? You know, I, 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 I don't have, you know, um, not attached to any educational institution anymore. But I think ethics is something which should be taught. Forget about design. You don't teach ethics and you are not making them caring human beings, you know. We can't see it. 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 You know, we as a society as a whole, we have one set of values and a totally different set of behavioral patterns. What sort of a human being does this produce? Take this schizophrenia yeah. and link this schizophrenia with the fact that you cannot get anything done without a bribe in this country. Mm -hmm. पहले ये होता था कि बाबा छुपाता था बेटे से कि मैं रिश्वत लेता हूँ अब बेटा और बाबा दोनों मिलके रिश्वत लेते हैं। I mean they they these are serious issues which yeah. impact the practice of architecture as well that practice land use as well the method the manner in which it emerges 
These are very fundamental ethical questions and they are societal questions. We desperately need societal values that can bridge the difference between traditional values and current behavioral patterns. How do you grow up if you don't do this? How do you grow up if you don't do this? So I think it's a more serious problem than just these poor architects and their teachers and... <laughs> but I think, Arun, it's very important because even the teachers are very unethical, you know, at times. So I really think that's very important because, you know, I mean, of course, people, students learn a lot at home, but... Then but you're right, should... college can be a corrective. Um, but you know, the disintegration that we're seeing of our social fabric, of course, it's mirrored in the disintegration of our urban fabric. And uh, yeah, sure. if we're actually to, to do rep reparation at an urban level, then I guess what the both of you are saying for our cities to actually be upgraded, we need to actually upgrade ourselves. And what we are thinking and communicating would you agree with well, that? I think uh, that at that least uh, these IAP and PCAT P can take a stand against it. They can push things. But they don't. Because I know in Turkey, you know, uh, there is this coach family, which is the richest family in Turkey. And they were going to start a university. They bought the land from the army and they were going to sit. You know, uh, establish a university in a forest area, army area, and the uh, whatever they call their organization, they like IAP, just took a stand. And for 10 years, didn't let Koch set up a university in an army forest. After 10 years, you know, they said, okay, now we, if you give us a design, we look at the design and we will then see how many trees will go and where mm -hmm. they're going from. And then we want you to grow some other trees somewhere else. So you know, that is the kind of stand which IEP should take. That kind of stand PKP should take. take but they don't. Oh, so, they don't. I think they do it everywhere. And that will attract young people towards you. It will attract, they are looking for a place where they can do something that is meaningful. It's not that it's not. You can see, this is a small area of urban resource center. Here, interns have about 30 to 50 applications every year. You can't accommodate them. We will do it with them, but we won't do it. But that's great that the Urban Resource Center is around and that um, actually you're providing young minds with a platform from which they can actually springboard ahead. But uh, how many of our actually young sort of graduates end up producing architecture of note is another question. And uh, I mean, how they engage with the urban fabric around their site is another question. I think that it is possible for an architect to listen to the client, but to also actually make a work that has some integrity with regards to the site or the location it is uh, sitting in. And um, now in order to actually sway government departments, do we need to actually start again at the grassroots as in we need to have good graduates with, uh, you know, expansive thinking about the city and its possibilities. You know very well, the PKP rules are. <laughs> so many thousand square foot area, covered area. I mean, give it a break, you know. No public no, space, nothing in front trying... of tall buildings. Yeah, I agree with you, uh, Professor Chiba and Arif Sab. It's very strange that, for instance, uh, we've got Gulberg in Lahore going completely vertical. Now you can build a 12-story building, for instance, on an 8 marla plot. But parking is left optional. 
and uh, surely all the cars that would actually come to use this building or the people in the, those cars will now be occupying space from where there would have once been sidewalks or uh, just moving streets dekhiye you have one one option wo humne exercise kiya kuch cheezon mein karachi mein which logo ne bahut mehnat ki us pe and that is the eia environmental impact assessment you have that option of organizing to through it to struggle against what you consider wrong or harmful for the city and for supporting what you consider to be favorable this is true that much of the eia is also rigged but you mm-hmm. can understand where it's rigged लोगों ने पकड़ा यहाँ से रिक है ये गलत है ये सही नहीं है बट अगेन यू नीड डेडिकेशन यू नीड टाइम यू नीड नॉलेज एंड दीज थिंग्स डोंट कम टुगेदर इन मेनी पीपल बट दे कैन कम टुगेदर इन ऑर्गेनाइजेशन और इन सेल्स दैट आर क्रिएटेड स्पेसिफिकली फॉर दिस पर्पस हो सकता है and on that op- very optimistic and hopeful note i will uh, pass it on to professor chima for a last word me for a last word yes <laughs> there's always hope with your generation think you have to do something about this if we fail i think you guys are uh, spearheading something that uh, will perhaps inspire us and of course more people to come with uh, more spirit and zeal to actually make our cities more livable and our buildings more livable and uh, on that note i'd like to thank you both for joining the llf and uh, for coming on and uh, i'd like to thank everyone who was watching good night good night thank you thank you very thank much thank you